Hi, I'm Doc Sloan. Thanks very much for joining me on my science fiction station. Tonight, at the end of our cinematic journey, it's time for me to review Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Hello folks, tonight I'm going to give you a few different reviews of Denis Villeneuve's Dune. The reason for this is, I have to say, our first viewing experience was really, really bad. And it would be very much unfair of me to give a proper review of this movie based on that experience. I've given some people my first impressions of the film. And uh, I kind of was in two different minds about it. But I have to say that having watched it at home, um, I have a very different opinion of the film. So first up, here comes my cinema experience. So for the cinema experience, I'm going to give the film a 1 out of 10. Uh, it was that bad, I have to say. Different combination of elements, but basically a very blurry, seemingly mostly out of focus screen made almost the entire last third of the film unwatchable. Uh, there were key details that we noticed after watching it at home that we simply were unaware of. So visually, it was as much as the special effects, etc. were very, very good. The film itself, for us on the screen, was appalling. Um, there were some aspects of watching the film where we went from uh, quite a lot of darkness to extreme light to darkness to extreme light, which was quite painful on the eyes, I thought. Um, in terms of the, the music, the music seemed to overpower almost everything and was relentless, and we didn't appreciate it. We would have difficulty listening to characters talk, and this would include characters like the Baron, who seemed to just mumble, and Dr. Yui just whispering. We were oblivious of what they were saying. And again, watching this at home with subtitles, we were probably missing about a third of the film's dialogue. So um, in the cinema, the pacing did not seem comfortable. It seemed slow and awkward. And I think that's just because we were in uncomfortable seats. But um, it was not a comfortable film to sit through over two and a half hours. Had to go to the bathroom twice and um, just not a good experience for us at all. The staff were lovely, by the way, at the cinema. Really nice. Um, the free promotion that was advertised with the movie to be the first showing was actually a free poster of the June movie and those posters hadn't arrived. So the staff were very apologetic, but there was nothing they could do. So it was a bit of a letdown on all fronts. We could barely see the film. We could barely hear the film. Uh, it was all round a bit confusing, blurry, not well presented, and the situation was not good. And I don't honestly know if I can put that down to just being how Denny Villeneuve's film has been resized and put through uh, into a normal cinema. I can't honestly say. But there were certainly large parts of the film where the image on the screen seemed really badly cropped. So for that reason, I'm giving it a 1 out of 10 as a viewing in a normal cinema. But here comes my other review of what it was like to watch it properly at home. Well, having watched the film in the cinema and not having had a particularly good experience, I have to say it came down to watching it at home. And thank goodness we had a much, much better viewing experience of Denny Villeneuve's Dune. Thank goodness, I have to say, I was really looking forward to this film. And with the movie being hyped as a love letter to cinema, I have to say, at the minute, I'm looking at it as a love letter to IMAX, but not as a love letter to cinema. I'm, I'm almost at this point looking at it as the film that nearly killed cinema for me. Um, so in watching it at home, I have to say, much better experience. Love the film. Um, I have my issues with it, which I'll discuss with you in a wee bit. But for just taking the different issues that we had while we were at the cinema, I suppose, visually the film is much, much better, much clearer. We could see everything, um, especially the sort of last 30 minutes of the film. We could hardly see a thing going on in the cinema that we were in. So um, that was a lot clearer. There was elements of detail, particularly with the mouse Moadib, uh, the kangaroo mouse, and the sort of hallucination that Paul was having. In the cinema, we actually thought we, didn't, we couldn't figure out where that voice was coming from. Uh, we couldn't see the mice at all. That's how bad the screen was. So it was great to see a lot more details um, watching it at home. Uh, little things like whenever the, the ornithopters fly over the cliffs, we couldn't see the people there at all. Um, and it just brought brought the world of Arrakis much more to life, I have to say. 
uh, one of the comments I'd made about the cinema experience was that we hadn't really seen much of the planet. And it turns out we had. We just couldn't really make it out very well. So visually, it was much more impressive. The special effects, I thought, were very good. There's points where they get a wee bit blurry deliberately, and I don't think that's always sort of necessary. Um, I don't think it's useful to throw sand in the, in the camera, <laughs> so to speak, um, when you're watching a film. The, the oral experience of the film was much, much better watching it at home again. Um, I said we watched it in the cinema. With, it was very bombastic, and I think that the music sort of linked in with this, a lot of the sound effects was very overpowering in places. Um, so watching it at home, that we didn't get quite that experience, though it was still quite almost intrusive into the film, I thought. Um, it was too much. Um, I really liked the sound effects, um, and I thought that the way the voice was done was quite interesting, but not the way I would have expected. Um, the pacing of the story, watching it at home, much, much better again. And it... I think it was really because we were really trying quite hard in the cinema to discern what on earth was going on, what on earth was being said, and what on earth we were looking at at certain points in the film. Just really bad. I have to say, I keep saying that, but it's, it was a really bad experience in the movies. So uh, watching it at home, as much as I've given it a one out of ten, um, I'm going to give it a much higher rating. And it was a much better experience. And I'm really glad I went. I got to see the film. And it... it um, yeah, I have to. I have to say it's a bit of a shame the way we saw the movie the first time. You know, um, in regards to the pacing of the film, I thought it was much much better at home again, really because we were able to get all the dialogue, get a sense of what was going on, and not especially with the last half of the film. Um, I think where the action can move quite quickly, we were just couldn't see what was going on, and we could barely hear what was going on as well. So it it didn't seem quite as laboured watching it at home and again I think that's a lot to do with the fact that we can hit pause when we need to go to the toilet that kind of thing that we can take our time and watch the film and enjoy the experience so um, from that point of view I have to say it, it was much more comfortable to watch it at home and a much more easy going and enjoyable experience the story itself I thought stuck pretty well to the book um, and though there are some significant changes um, I have to say it was, again, I was able to follow it better the uh, the second time around watching it at home. Um, my wife went to see it with me in the cinema and she did not enjoy the film at all. She did not enjoy the experience at all, but she also felt that she couldn't follow the story and had no idea what was going on. Um, it, it absolutely put her off the book and a possible sequel, so, <laughs> which is quite sad, I have to say. The first 15 minutes of the story, I think, are, are what I would call space opera eye candy and are rather pointless in the whole um, state of affairs of the, of the story, I suppose. Um, they're, they're good. It's, it's an interesting visual uh, way of pointing out different groups in the universe, but it doesn't solve, serve to carry the story forward in any way. Um, and it, all of this interchange, I think, could have. I think somebody points out in the film, it's why are we bothering to do this? <laughs> and it's a good question. So that was one of the things I thought was a bit sad was that I think the first fifteen minutes of the film, which is very much new writing and new interactions created for the film, rather than lifted from the book, I think were wasted in terms of how information can be presented to us. And I also thought that the the knowledge of Arrakis being presented to Paul sort of in the background via a film book um, was very subtle and I don't think would have imprinted its, itself properly upon the audience. In terms of the acting in the film, I thought it was very good all round and I thought Timothy Chalamet has brought his own thing um, very much to the character of Paul Atreides and I was quite pleased about that because I think all of the actors that have played Paul Atreides before have done a really good job but each one has brought their own thing to the role. And I, I think we've seen it. We have um, Kyle MacLachlan as Paul in the David Lynch film. We have Alec Newman as Paul Atreides in the TV series. Um, both doing very much their own thing, and I think both did very well with it. So it was nice to see Timothy Chalamet doing something a bit different with the role. Um, and re again, I think making it fresh um, and bringing something something new to it that that is that's 
I think it's it's good to see that we have three different actors who brought three very different and very good approaches to the character. So I really enjoyed Paul, um, the character of Paul Atreides, as uh, played by Timothy Chalamet. I thought both Oscar Isaac and Rebecca Ferguson were very good in their roles as Jessica and Leto. Um, I thought the chemistry between them wasn't quite brilliant on the screen, but I thought both actors did very good jobs in their individual roles, if you see what I mean. And I thought um, Oscar Isaac brought a good sense of Leto the first to the screen. Um, I thought Jessica was played quite well by Rebecca Ferguson. They've transferred some of the elements of Paul um, onto her character. And I think one of the things that I wasn't too um, sure about was that they've given the character a vulnerability that I think she doesn't have in the... Um, not to that level anyway in the books. But um, at the same time, this is a very strong character. Um, so I thought uh, Rebecca Ferguson did a great job... Um, playing Jessica. My other concern, I suppose, was I did think a lot of the minor characters were underused. I thought all the Mentats were underused. And um, I, I actually thought, in particular, the Baron was underused. Um, though I, I thought Stalin Skarsgård as the Baron Vladimir was really, really good, I have to say. I thought he's, he's brought real presence and gravitas to the role and uh, a, a good sense of the Baron's villainy. Um, though I have to say a large number of elements of the Baron's character have been totally removed for uh, a modern audience as I think they would be considered unpalatable. I thought a number of the minor characters from the books were underused and we didn't get to see a lot of actors uh, with a lot of screen time with these roles. Um, you get that sense also in David Lynch's Dune, I think, but... Uh, particularly, for example, uh, Thufur and Piter, I thought were very underdeveloped um, compared to, say, David Lynch's Dune. And again, I think characters like Gaius Helm Mohim, uh, you know, um, the Shadowed Mapes, and even to a degree Jamas, were, were underused. Um, and I thought that that was a shame because a lot of these characters bring various shades to the story. And sometimes quite important messages um, so I think that's one of the one of the sadder things I thought about the film was that we were we focused an awful lot on the major characters especially Jessica and Paul but the world around them seemed um, diminished a bit and, and I thought especially when I saw the city of Arakeen that I didn't get a sense that it was Ara a, you know a populated city at all um, it looked like a heavily shielded just uh, industrial blobular mess, I suppose. So a lot of the special effects in some aspects, I thought, in terms of scale, um, allowed us to not see much detail, if you get my meaning. Um, but I have to say, the sets looked fantastic, the costumes looked fantastic, the special effects were unbelievable, the desert looks beautiful, and I really like the way the, you get the hint of melange in the desert. Um, so I, I would say still one of the criticisms is is it's hard to see some of the stuff in the in the uh, in the last half hour of the film when they're in the desert at night. But as it's much clearer whenever watching it at home. So I have to say, folks, whenever whenever I have watched the film at home, then really I did enjoy the film a lot better than I did in the cinema. Um, I I really did enjoy it. Um, I, I would possibly argue at, at this point in the review that you might need to read have read the book if you really want to follow this film. And we do have to we do have to consider that this is only part one of a film, that it's not a complete thing, and that we have another part of this story to go. So based on that, I have to say I really enjoyed the movie. Um, I, I was able to follow it a lot better. Um, I love the spectacle of uh, the spaceships, the guild, the costumes. Um, the music was a bit much, I have to say. And um, in places of of musical boom, 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 etc. I think a little bit of exposition could have gone a, a lot further. Um, but um, I really enjoyed the film. I thought it looked beautiful uh, compared to the, the terrible mess it was on the cinema screen that we saw earlier. So it was it was a real feast for the eye, not so much for the ear, I think, um, I have to say. Um, and for the film that length, I thought it was well paced in the end. So it's interesting to think that actually... 
having had a bad cinema experience, I've given it a one out of ten, but having watched it at home, and really thank goodness, you know, uh, that I did take the opportunity to go and see it, to see it again. So I would happily give the film a seven out of ten, um, and I would give it a higher score um, if it really wasn't for the sound, to be honest, and some of the the blurriness of the film, which is still there even with a good version of the film on screen, you know. So I would give it a 7 out of 10, folks, for my second watch, which was based on a home viewing. Now, just before we go, folks, I'm, I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to give you one more review, and that's based on my consideration of the film as an adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune novel. Okay, this third review is based on looking at Denis Villeneuve's Dune as an adaptation of Frank Herbert's novel and considering how faithful it is to the original book and wondering about what changes are made within the film that may cause some issues with the story. So let's take a look. So the first big difference between the book and the film is the first 15 minutes of the movie itself, which bear very little resemblance to the story. Um, this 15 minutes, I suppose, could have been used much, much better in the film. And instead, we get some, we get a brief visual look at an event that um, kind of precedes the story. And that really doesn't tell us too much, but actually just shows us some of the power players within the Dune universe. Um, it doesn't really explain too much about who they are. So apart from that, we get a couple of um, scenes where we get to see Paul interact with his parents, uh, with both Jessica and Leto. And the breakfast scene with uh, Jessica and Paul is all quite new and presents a slightly different aspect to both of their characters. Um, the scene with Leto is, it works, I suppose, in some ways, but is a bit different, again, on how we would view their relationship within the book. In terms of Paul's character, uh, one of the major elements of his character that's left out of the film is the fact that he's a mentat. Now, I understand that Denis Villeneuve has gone on record in saying that this is very much an aspect of Paul's character that he's going to develop in the second Dune movie. Um, however, um, there's a, a fair amount to Paul's character that comes with being a mentat, and I would argue that that affects his emotional character as well. Um, the scenes where we get to see him behaving like the Mentat Duke that we're expecting him to be um, are both removed from the film. So namely that would be the scene where he, he, he goes to Leto's council and the other one would of course be the banquet scene. In terms of Paul's character itself, his superhuman qualities are being diminished within the film and certain traits of his are being handed to Jessica as a character. Um, and I'm not quite sure why. I think the intent is to build up Jessica's character more than... Uh, uh, and I think that's a way of viewing her character as not being fleshed out or not being quite right, which I think is a wrong way to look at her. Um, there's an aspect of Jessica's character that suggests a lot more vulnerability um, I think Danny Villeneuve talks about the femininity of the character, but um, I, I've never viewed Jessica as a vulnerable character in that sense. Um, and uh, I think both characters, because of that, um, seem less than they actually are in the book. I think um, both are diminished in terms of their, their power and their presence, if you see what I mean. Um, I think they're both very well presented, and they're, but they are presented slightly different, I think, in terms of their character. Jessica more so than Paul, I think. And I think the problem with taking away elements of Paul, of Paul's journey as a hero, um, and giving them to Jessica is we don't quite see the, the level of growth uh, that we, we should see with Paul, and that, that, that it is beyond far beyond normal, if you see what I mean. So the, the loss of the mentat ability there ties into being able to see higher dimensional thinking, etc., etc., and ties very much into the idea of him being the Kwisat Sadarak and, and um, um, a mentat. I suppose the other point, I think, was very much that the mentats were underused heavily in the film, and 
much more so than they are in the book. And they're, they're very, very well developed in the book, I think, as characters. Even though we don't see too much, I would say, argue of Pider. Um, but we do see a fair bit of uh, Thufir Howitt uh, in the book. And again, we have to put this down to we're going to see more of this character in part two. But a large part of his character arc, I would argue, um, that we should see it developed in this first part of the film is gone. And I think most of the most of the minor characters don't seem well fleshed out. I think they're acted well enough by the actors, but there's there's very little to work with and nothing iconic, I think, compared to what we see in the David Lynch film. So um just the loss of the Mentat thread that's being part of the Quizant Sadrach, as I said, I think Danny Villeneuve's going to address that in the second film. Um, my understanding is that in terms of the themes, really that um that the, the film is running with the evolution theme and the catastrophic hero theme. So my other major I would argue that my major criticism of the film is the character of Liat Kynes and the the theme that June is most famous for which is it's uh, that of ecology, um, I think have been handled badly. Arguably, I'd say that the one message that's lost heavily, I think, within the first Dune movie, or part one of Dune, is the ecological message. And I think this is for a number of reasons. The first, I would argue, is the changing of the Liat Kynes character, who is the main character that delivers a lot of Frank Herbert's ecological ideas. Um, this character does so primarily in certain scenes, but in particular, for example, at the banquet scene, uh, which has been removed from the film. So that also wasn't in David Lynch's movie, but there's aspects of Kynes' character that are designed to educate the reader, and I'm assuming hopefully the film goer, in ecology. In relation to the Liat Kynes character, um, this is the article from the Los Angeles Times, uh, written by Josh Rottenberg. Um, it's an interview with Danny Villeneuve about the gender swapping of Liet Kynes. In one of the most significant alterations from Herbert's book, the film changes the gender of the character of Liet Kynes, a planetologist with a deep love for Arrakis and the Fremen, from male to female. While Max von Sydow portrayed the character in Lynch's film, here Kynes is played by British actress Sharon Duncan Brewster. When Spates suggested the change during the film's development, Villeneuve immediately jumped at the idea. I said, that's brilliant, he says, because it doesn't change the nature of the character. It just makes it closer to the world today and more relevant and, frankly, more interesting. Villeneuve also gave the character a far more dramatic and cinematic death than in the novel. In the book, Kynes dies alone in a natural underground eruption of gas called a spice blow after being abandoned in the desert. In the film, Kynes is stabbed by a Sardaukar soldier, then summons a sandworm to swallow up both her and her killer, a moment of big screen visual effects razzle-dazzle, accompanied by Hans Zimmer's swelling score. In the same article it says, Ultimately, Villeneuve's goal was to boil the story down to universal things that don't require a PhD in genealogy to understand. <laughs> the problem with the Liat Kynes character actually runs quite deep within the story of Dune and the message of Dune. And there's a reason why the character is male and represents Western man. And there's also a reason why the character dies a particular way that they do in the film. So apparently the reasons for gender swapping Liat Kynes are to do with representation on the screen. And I think that this has been done with in choosing that character, uh, a lack of understanding of what the character represents to Frank Herbert, and especially in terms of the ecological message that Frank Herbert's trying to get across in the Dune novels. I suppose in terms of re gender representation within the characters of Dune, um, almost any other character outside of possibly Paul and Jessica and Leto could have been gender swapped, no problem. Um, in fact, I think there is a fair bit of gender swapping in Dune in the first place if you actually look at particularly characters' names. Leto is named after the uh, Greek goddess who's the mother of Artemis and Apollo, for example. Uh, whereas Gaius Helena Mohiam uh, bears the first name of Gaius Julius Caesar. 
So um, in terms of there being a problem with gender swapping the character, there isn't one unless we, we are talking about um, Frank Herbert's ecological message. Because in that case, that character very much represents um, systemic thinking, Western man's attitude to ecology, and is very much the character who brings about the doom of the Fremen. So the interesting thing is if, if we look at changing of all the roles that we could have changed in terms of let's, this is the character who, uh, who's to blame for everything, uh, then it's kind of an odd character to pick to shift from male to female, if you see what I mean. And I think it's a bit of an own goal in that sense, because this it's this character's thinking who is wrong. And um, it's only at the point of this character's death where we realise through their hallucinations and, and their own activity within the story that they've been wrong about their thinking the whole time. Um, and it's too late. And the character is killed by the planet and Frank Herbert's on record saying, very, very important that Liet Kynes was killed by the planet. The ecologist is killed by the planet he's trying to tame. In terms of gender swapping the character and putting all the blame onto a female character as opposed to a male character who represents Western man, I think that's a bit of an own goal um, in terms of fem an attempt at feminism by a man, I think. Um, at the same time, because that character uh, the interactions with the still suits, for example, is diluted. The banquet scene is gone. And how they educate us on water and on the planet Arrakis itself and what they say, more importantly, what they don't say. Um, but it's particularly through Leah Kynes um, that we learn so much about um, the nature of the ecology of Arrakis. And not just that, elements that are in the film that we don't really get to get a proper sense of. I don't think we really get a sense of melange at all in terms of what it does and what a, what a universal type of drug it is. Um, so we get a hint that a couple of people use it, but we, we don't really get the sense that um, it's widespread within the Imperium. We don't really get a sense of the politics of, um, of Dune itself, of Arrakis, and the various different power groups that are there. And I also think we get very little sense of the importance of water. The little pieces that we do get from the eight kinds from, I think, hallucinations that are that should be attributed to Pardo kinds, I think, are given to uh, Jamis. Um, I think the ecological message has been seriously watered down. And um, I think it's in, in favour of the dangerous hero message. And my only concern is it's not really important, that, you know, in terms of what Danny Villeneuve wants to do with Jun. Does he want to really bring the ecological message that Frank Herbert was trying to push? I think I'm not too sure, but I think it's heavily watered down, and we don't quite get enough sense of Paul as a superhuman um, either. I think that's watered down too, and even the sense of evolution. I think a lot of stuff's withheld from us as an audience who um who may not know what's going on and I think we're left to we keep hearing this cinema as a visual medium, it's it's an aural medium as well, you know. Um, um you know, so you know, we don't have to do seeing things as part of it, but we can hear as well, you know. So I think there's an awful lot that's been left out in terms of the film for pacing, etc. Uh, in favour of other things that are are almost eye candy. And um, I think that's a shame. But I think particularly the Liet Kynes character is an own goal. I think we've lost the ecological message with Liet Kynes. Uh, fundamentally, the one character, and we know that character's dead. But not only that, I think it was a bit of an own goal for feminism. And I would argue that the character who should be killed by the planet um, and represents, you know, uh, Western civilization. Western man's thinking, Western man's systemic thinking. This person, this male character, is made into a female character uh, who we're going to blame for everything, ultimately, and then ends up having not one but two phallic deaths. Um, she's stabbed by, the, you know, by a man who's a sardaukar, and then she brings about her own death by a giant worm, which I suppose is the, is the ultimate phallic symbol. 
So I think um I think genuinely that whatever the intent there, I, I don't think it worked. Um and I think Kynes is too quick to, to reach for the still suits. I think there's things in the in the behaviour of some characters that seem rushed when they shouldn't be. And other things that are taking their time that I think that should move a bit more quickly. I'd say one of my other concerns was the character of Jamas I thought was underused. And there's more to Jamas in terms of his belligerence and how, how he behaves towards Paul and uh, Jessica. And in particular how he behaves towards Stilgar. And um, I think Jamis, Jamis should should have been should be on the screen more. I think and shown to be much more aggressive than he is, to be much more unreasonable than he is. Um, apart from that, I think uh, we've talked about underused characters and so on. But I think the the Baron's character um, has there's not a lot that fleshes him out, so to speak. No pun intended anymore. Um, the negative aspects of the Baron's character have been removed, um, so there's no suggestion of the Baron's homosexuality or the Baron's paedophilic nature, especially towards Paul, which you get quite a lot of in the uh, in the book. So that's all gone, and I, I again I think I've said it's pretty much something that I think is unpalatable for a modern audience. In terms of other aspects of the book. Um, I, I certainly think that there's uh, things that are there and things that aren't there, and not too much bothered me. But the the one thing that really did concern me, and I and I was sort of worried a wee bit about it, thinking it'd be watered down, was the ecological message of the book. And I think that's a really big part of the book. I think it's a massive part of Dune, and I'd argue that it's what Dune is most famous for. Um, so to have that. See, it's not removed completely, but it's not obvious, and it doesn't really seem particularly relevant. I think um, the other sort of thing I would say is that we get more of a sense of we don't really get much of a sense of Ar Arrakis's population or or any sense of time that the the Atreides may have to adjust to going there. It, it just seems that in terms of the film that they just land and Bob's your uncle. It's all over pretty much. Um, so I don't know. There, I I think it. I think there's things that aren't in the film because possibly they've been done in the David Lynch version, and I think that there's been a desire here to do everything quite different. I would say that we don't we don't have that sense of, um, you know, some there's some of the iconic lines that I don't think we've heard. We haven't heard "Walk Without Rhythm," um, you know, um, and though we do have the litany of fear, that's one of those things that is taken from Paul and given to um, Jessica. So in terms of an adaptation of the book so far, um, I think it's not bad, but I, I think there's major elements of the book missing. Um, and I think that the story is very diminished by the lack of characters in it. I think there's um, or, or certainly the lack of fleshing out of characters. In the sense of how the film is going to be different from the book, that's a given, I think. But for me, I think one of the big issues of the film, its message in that sense, is that the film's meant to be timely. That um, all of, and it is timely. And it, if we consider it as it timely in its warnings about political heroes, etc., and we've just seen Donald Trump, uh, then no, it's too late, unfortunately. Um, but uh, not that, as I always say, you need to be warned about people like Donald Trump, or you shouldn't need to be warned about people like Donald Trump. But in that case, is it timely now for its ecological message? Well, absolutely. And um, it's a real shame, I think, that you know that this could be, you know, June should almost be the movie poster child for the Greta Thunberg generation. This this is a, a meant to be an ecological primer. It's um it's a, such a well known well well respected science fiction work, and um I I I can only hope really that we get a a much bigger sense of the ecological message, um in part two, but the the real problem for me is that most of that message is delivered in part one, and uh, by the characters in particular that we're talking about who are underused to a degree, but you know especially um Shadowed Mapes, and uh, Leit Kynes. Um, and of course, as I said, both you know the the banquet scene as well, 
is a, is a big, big part of that. And also sort of kind of where we get certain alliances made that kind of work in favour of the Atreides later on. So um, very much so, although they're hinted at, we get the word smugglers within the film. Um, there are characters that we haven't seen uh, that we kind of should have seen by now. Um, and I'm not too sure how much uh, how much of this, and especially to keep the cast quite small, I think, uh, in terms of June, how much of this is down to COVID, I honestly can't say. So if, if it's a question of making these changes really just to be, uh, you know, to, to have representation of, of uh, female actresses on the screen, then it's a, I, I, I'd argue that almost any other character would have been better to choose than, than Liat Kynes for the very specific reasons of what that character represents. And I think it's a bit of an own goal uh, for feminism, if you see what I mean, um, <laughs> by a man. Uh, but there we go. So um, that's my opinion. I think there's, there's, um, there's, I don't think we get a sense of the Butlerian Jihad too much. I think the technology looks far too futuristic, and I know that that was a criticism of uh, Lynch's film, that he kind of got that mechanical sense of how the technology might be correct, I think. Um, but some of the spaceships looked like they belonged more in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy than, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they just seemed a bit daft, I think. But, um, they, you know, they look silly. <laughs> far too big, if you know what I mean. Not practical. But, um, that's just me, but I mean, they they looked great on the screen. But um, I I just also think we didn't get a sense properly of, of the whole, um, and tied into the ecology, the whole sort of hydraulic despotism attached to Melange and, uh, and water, and particularly, you know, the nature of, of, the, uh, of the monopoly of the guild and things like that. Um, and I, I think also some of the characters were a bit frosty, I think. Uh, and I'd, I'd say characters that came across as Frosty, I'd, I'd say Jessica, the Reverend Mother, Gaius Helm O'Hame, and, and Leto to a degree, a wee bit. Um, but otherwise, I have to say, folks, that's I don't think there's a lot of things that tear up the book, if you see what I mean. I think it's more about what's missing. And, you know, things that are underdeveloped or underused, and we're kind of, I think the most Dune fans will kind of wonder how they'll play out. But I'm sure at this point only Danny Villeneuve knows. And we have had the fact that the, the film has been greenlit for part two. And I think we're going to see a conclusion to uh, June in around October 2023, I believe. So only a couple of years to wait. And we have to remember that this is part one. And um, the things that we think are missing may have been moved around or adjusted. Um, and it's just part of the movie making process, I suppose. Um, but there we go. So that's the end of my review, I suppose. In terms of an adaptation of the book, I think I would give it a 5 or a 6 out of 10. Um, but again, I'd be happy to review all this sort of process once I've seen the film in its entirety. Um, but there we go, folks. That's the end of my review of June. Hi, everyone. I'm Doc Sloan, and I'd like to thank you for watching my science fiction station. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback on our videos. If you enjoy the content, please give it a like. And if you're a bit of a fan of science fiction, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and spread the word. Thanks very much. Bye bye.